than just code on mtjc.fm. And, uh, you know, I've actually, uh, I was talking to Atsushi just a little bit before the stream started here that uh, I just crossed my first year as a full-time DevRel professional, which is uh, which is pretty exciting because I, um, you know, I got into developer relations uh, sort almost accidentally. Um, I ended up seeing the the CFP, the call for proposals that DevRelCon Tokyo 2019 had opened, and thought, oh well, you know, I've been doing this podcasting thing. Maybe I can have a, a really good angle to talk about helping developers by podcasting. I was very fortunate that uh, the organizers chose my my talk. I flew to to Tokyo and enjoyed um, you know not only giving the talk and sharing my knowledge, but learning from all the other DevRel professionals there. And a few months later, an opportunity came up to take on a developer advocate job at Jack Henry and Associates, and uh, that's how I got into this. And it's uh, been a lot of learning. I've really enjoyed um, sort of this different approach to things, and uh, you know, it's it's just been a lot of fun. A lot of challenges at times, but definitely something that I would highly recommend for folks who are interested in trying developer relations. I see. So I think uh, uh, when you come into the Tokyo for. Uh, Developer Tokyo, uh, there is no name YouTuber on like that. So I think uh, your podcast, like a DJ or uh, broadcasting technology or communication with podcasting, it's a very uh, rare and it's a very just only you uh, to do that. I think so. Currently. There are so many yeah. technology YouTubers. What do right. you think about that? I, I think it's really neat because uh, if you knew that, oh, I want to get into something, it's as simple as going to YouTube, typing in, you know, I want to learn, you know, uh, React or I want to learn machine learning or, you know, I want to learn um, Swagger and open API specs. There's probably a whole bunch of really good videos out there. They could be conference talks, but increasingly, and I think this is what you're talking about here, increasingly there's many people who, who live stream. There are people who record videos that are specifically about teaching you, the audience, and it's not just teacher talking, it's let me react to, uh, to stuff that's going in the comments or emails that they got and people will you know, have you know, Twitch and mm -hmm. uh, Twitter and all these other SNS systems that, you know, TikTok and, and, and et cetera. So it's, it's really, I think, a great time to be a developer right now because there is so much technology and, and so many enthusiasts out there that um, are able to share their knowledge. Mm, I see. And uh, I want to know about how to uh, control your motivation to uh, Broadcast just from you, like uh, this is this is a uh, conversation, and uh, I mm -hmm. can control motivation because I talk with you. But uh, in the podcast, it's just for just only you, right? So no, actually, in in this case, um, I'm actually fortunate that there are two other co-hosts, mm -hmm. so oh, it's wow. more like uh, like friends or coworkers, colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, academics even talking about here are mm -hmm. these technologies that we're working with, here mm -hmm. are these problems we're having with technology. And I think it's mm -hmm. it really helps one, uh, educate people, but also mm -hmm. two, people feel like, oh, they sound like they know what they're doing. And if they struggle and talk mm -hmm. about how they get over it, then if I am struggling, then that's okay. I'm not, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not you know, bad in any way. It's just part of the process of learning is 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 struggling and then, you know, overcoming and achieving. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Okay. And uh, I want to more questions uh, about uh, your banking APIs. So currently, many bank bank companies try to make public APIs or private APIs, uh, 
how to uh, break uh, uh, maybe two years uh, two years ago uh, there is few apis the mm -hmm. after the two years what is changing or what is uh, uh, what do you think about what is difficult to public apis for banking yeah i i can mostly talk about it from a, a usa perspective because like mm -hmm. one of the things that's a little different about uh financial technology is it is very dependent upon which country or which regions mm -hmm. you're talking about so i could talk mostly about the usa i know a little bit about what's going on in the european union mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and i know nothing at all about what's going on in asia so i apologize mm -hmm. to the viewers for that but oh. In the USA, we have um, a very challenging financial technology um, environment where mm. there hasn't been as much investment in technology sort of historically, as opposed to other places. Like I'll, I'll point to the European Union that has done a very, very solid job of having a regulatory environment. So the, the, mm -hmm. the government regulators have incentivized, and in the case of Europe, they're PSD2, that's Payment Services mm -hmm. Directive 2, said you must, as a banker, you must provide APIs and they must be secure mm -hmm. and they must be mm -hmm. standardized so that if you, the you know, the user of a bank, right, you're you're a customer, mm -hmm. if you say, Well, I I want to connect, you know, this other fintech app, I found this really cool mm -hmm. app, or uh, I want to move to this other bank, they're doing a lot to make that that great and easy for you. So it, mm. it, it kind of feels like, like if you have a pulse, you have a bank in the in the United Kingdom as an example, right? Mm. There's so many good companies out there like Starling and Monzo and Revolut and et cetera. They're doing exciting stuff. In the mm. USA, we're, we're not quite at that level yet. Like there isn't any regulatory thing, but one mm. of the things that I've been working on is, is using what I see as some of the, the good ideas and the best practices that, is going on in Europe and say, wow, maybe maybe five years, maybe 10 years from now, the United States will have very similar laws. I don't know, but if, if we can start preparing now, then mm -hmm. we will be leading the, the, the industry if mm -hmm. and when that becomes a thing, right? So we're doing a lot to push as much of our technology out into the open public web, mm -hmm. having example projects on GitHub, working yeah. with um, not just, oh, we decided an API should look this way. We're actually working mm -hmm. with, uh, let's say, like the financial data exchange organization. Oh. The FDX is trying to consolidate um, standards, open standards oh, around yeah. how do you structure APIs? What do tra you know transactions look like? What do mm -hmm. accounts and balances look like? There's a million mm -hmm. different ways that, that companies could come up with it. And it's so much easier to integrate when you have mm -hmm. one standard, right? Like as an example, mm -hmm. like HTML5 for uh -huh. browsers is a standard and every browser can support HTML5 and everything mm -hmm. is better because we're not worrying about trying to integrate. We're building really cool things because everybody has that same open technology. That's that's kind of the mm -hmm. idea and that's sort of where, where things are at the moment uh, in the USA. I see, but uh, I think uh, financial have to focus on the security every time because uh, money is very important asset for everyone, I think. Yes. Yeah, so, so uh, as an example of something that we've taken from um, the, the European Union ideas is I think in the EU, they're standardizing on OAuth for, mm -hmm. for authorized uh, securely uh -huh. and um, OpenID Connect as a way to oh, identify yeah. mm -hmm. like, you know, who is this authenticated user Mm -hmm. um, and even though we're not required in any way to do so in the United States, uh, my company, Jack Henry, and on the Bano team, we're building our APIs like, yeah, we should use mm -hmm. those. Those are you know, not our standards. Those are open standards of OAuth 2 and OpenID mm -hmm. Connect. So we're we're keeping up with that so that uh, we can say, look, look, here's what we're doing. Uh, you'll know how to use it because there's wonderful developer advocates over at Okta and Auth0 and Fusion mm -hmm. Auth are doing a lot of cool things. They mm -hmm. they know Auth uh, backwards and forwards and we can benefit from, mm -hmm. from that as a community and, and therefore offer uh, secure APIs that are standards based to, to customers. I see. 
And uh, I have another question about uh, uh, blockchain or cryptocurrency for your company, because uh, in the China, so many developers uh, have interest in the, about uh, cryptocurrency or blockchain technology. So how how about you? Oh, that's a good question. I you know so Jack Henry is actually fairly large, and and my team um, that works on uh, mostly online banking and mobile banking. Um, mm -hmm. We we currently don't have any you know uh, blockchain or cryptocurrency type support. I don't know if there's other parts of the company that are working on that. I. I'd have to guess that there's, you know, just like everybody else in the financial industry, everybody's at mm. least looking to see what's going on there. They're definitely mm -hmm. pretty excited to see, as you mentioned, like what's going on in China and, and some of the, the cool things mm -hmm. they're doing. Um, as an aside, one thing that I thought was pretty interesting when I visited Tokyo mm -hmm. was how prevalent the Suica and Pasmo oh, yeah, were, yeah, yeah, which is like everything. It wasn't helpful, just yeah. it wasn't just Subway. It mm -hmm. was restaurants. It mm -hmm. was uh, mm -hmm. vendors on the street and 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 vending machines. You know, getting yeah. like a a, mm -hmm. a lemon Coke or something was was pretty interesting because we don't really have that sort of thing here. Like the closest thing mm. is to use like, you know, the Apple watch or something with Apple pay, I, uh, I but, but we don't have like an integrated pass that would very easily make it to go from, mm -hmm. you know, jumping on the train and then getting something to eat and taking the train back and everything. So that, that was pretty interesting. So again, that's mm -hmm. why I said at the beginning that I, I don't know a ton of what's going on in the, the financial services space in mm -hmm. uh, in Japan and other parts of Asia, but I'd I'd have to imagine that there's really cool things going on there too. Mm, I see. But uh, on the other hand, uh, Japanese using uh, cash right right now, so we can yeah. use the uh, Pasmo or Sika, but the most of payment is cash. It's a very difficult to bring it and uh, i want i want to use the uh, credit cards or pasmo but uh, some restaurant or shop yeah uh, doesn't accept the credit card right now but the, in the us maybe all of shop or restaurant accept a credit card right yes so that was very that was very difficult for me, like the very first day or two I was in Japan, where mm -hmm. um, only the touristy areas took credit cards. Like, I think the mm -hmm. only time I was able to use a credit card was at the Samurai Museum uh, Samurai in, in Kabukicho. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, the, literally the very first meal, I felt very bad for the person behind me because I went to go pay with my watch because uh -huh. I used to do that in the United States. And it's like, oh, it's not working. I'm like, hmm. mm -hmm. well, maybe my phone. No, I was like, I don't know if I have money with me and i went through my oh. wallet as a like, credit card no don't credit uh -huh. card uh yes. oh, oh oh posmo do you take posmo like yes <laughs> thankfully i had enough to pay for like the the udon or ramen that i got for my first meal <laughs> <laughs> well the person behind me the salary man is just waiting in line and just wants to eat his food right uh, but yeah you're right uh you're right uh, in the united states um uh, most places will take credit card uh, of course every place will take cash hardly anybody mm -hmm. ever wants to see a check uh, like a written check, like the, people don't like that. Um, and there are increasingly uh, NFC based payments, contactless payments like uh, Apple Pay mm -hmm. and Google Pay and and some alternatives like uh, Walmart has its own QR code based system. That's that's kind of like like uh, Alipay or, or WePay. Mm, oh, Alipay, mm, I see. Okay, so uh, second session, Second topic is uh, your talk. So I will find out about that. Okay, so you, your title is uh, you were the first devil at your company. Now what? So uh, please talk about the uh, uh, abstract of your talk, please. Yeah, so it's uh, talking from my experience, as uh, as I'd mentioned uh, at the beginning. Um, you know, I was uh, hired as developer advocate uh, on the Bana team at Jack Henry, and as it turns out, I was the first and only developer advocate for a, a very long time um, uh, for for most of the past year. 
And that is uh, both exciting and a little bit challenging, right? It's like, okay, there is a lot of um, a lot of expectations, of course, right? They 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 liked me, obviously, from the the interview, and, and were really hoping that uh, I would do great things, especially given some of my um, my resume background of the things I'd done uh, as an engineer, as as a technical leader. Um, but uh, as you might expect, um, when you compare against something like, let's say, Stripe or Twilio, or you know, pick your favorite DevRel program. They usually tend to have teams for those, and they do a brilliant job, a very fantastic job of having a, a great developer experience and making things crisp and clear in the technical docs and a lot of you know, coding examples. Uh, but I'm just one person. <laughs> and then though uh, I, I wanted to, to do many of those things, it, of course, wasn't going to fall 100% on me because there's, there's really so much, only so much time in the day. Um, so... I had to really find my way through um, being new to this uh, this particular kind of role, uh, being new to dev uh, DevRel, being a, a new developer advocate, and also being to a new uh, new company. Although I, I did have an experience in financial services, working at a, a, a neo bank before, so at least I had that helping me. But I also had to come up with sort of different ways to scale what I was doing, right? Um, I had to really come up with ways that were going to maximize how many developers could be helped at once while having very, very, very few resources that are dedicated. And, and some of that turned out to be working in partnership with other parts of the organization. And my talk will talk about uh, doing that. So not just taking everything on your own shoulders, but partnering with other different areas of your company that can help lend in a hand if you're guiding the way there. And then also talking about how, um, you know, the challenges can turn into opportunities. Uh, as a little bit of a spoiler, um, I was successful enough in what I was doing that the company said, wow, we actually want to start building your team. So now we're a team of two. So we've doubled our capacity. And, and so I'm very excited to have somebody new and fresh on the team that can help me out. But again, it's still only a couple of people, so we still have to use the same techniques to get a lot of um, a lot of value uh, as using something like Stripe or Twilio as inspiration, but realizing that there's only so much we can do given um, you know given the resources that we have. And I'm I'm guessing that's probably a situation that uh, a fair number of developer advocates might find themselves in that there's. Very rarely a team of 20, 50, or 100 DevRel mm -hmm. people. It's usually 10 people or fewer with many developers to, to support. I see. So your team become double in two years, right? So a Double within one year, although it, it was close to oh, the end why? of one year before, uh, mm -hmm. before we got the headcount, the, the budget to have another person. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's still, you know, it's still a, a very, you know, scrappy team ready to, mm -hmm. to do whatever we can as the, the underdogs, as you might say. <laughs> I see. It's funny. So what is your most challenging uh, in your DevRel culture, a uh, DevRel career? Sorry. Most challenging thing. Um, well, there, there's sort of two things. I'll talk about. Um, like technical challenge, uh, and, and I'll talk about um, sort of uh, like people challenge, right? So like a technical skill and soft skill. So on the on the technical skill challenge, a big challenge for me was trying to get up to speed on OAuth and OpenID Connect. It's very very complicated technologies, a, a ton of different specs. There's a ton of different implementations. And even though I had been a, a user of, of OAuth before, usually through like login with Google, login with Facebook, login with Twitter type thing. So I kind of knew how the authentication flow worked. That was usually abstracted away at a, at a higher level by using like Facebook's SDK or Google's mm. SDK. But being on the API side meant that we we don't have that, right? Like I had to learn the details of how does OAuth work. And that's why I spent a fair mm -hmm. amount of time 
uh, watching really great YouTube videos from like Aaron Parecki <laughs> from from Okta <laughs> and uh, reading blogs from the Auth0 from their developer mm. advocates, right? Who'd done a, a good job of explaining in 15 minutes, here's OAuth, <laughs> right? I was like, okay, great, that's fantastic. Um, and then on the people side, it was very different for me going into DevRel where I do have an engineering background as a developer mm -hmm. advocate. I spent uh, many years as an iOS engineer and many years mm -hmm. before that as a backend or uh, web engineer. Uh -huh. um, in this role, although I do do coding and I am often mm -hmm. involved in code reviews, I'm not an engineer. So mm -hmm. it feels like I have to sort of let go or learn to let go of uh -huh. You know, the engineer is going to build the product a particular way, and I can give you know, maybe my advice on how things might impact, um, you know, third-party developers. Mm. But then it, it's up to them, right? I'm not there coding the the solution necessarily. I am learning about what the solution is, learning the pros and cons, and trying to understand those so that I can help uh, not only teach third-party developers but advocate on their behalf and say, you know, this part might be a little bit easier if we did this improvement, right? So mm -hmm. that, that learning to let go that I couldn't just jump in and change everything, not necessarily because I didn't have uh, the skill set, but because it's not really my role because there mm -hmm. are very many other things I could be working on like technical docs and content, tutorials, or even coding up my own projects and examples to explain the concepts. I see. So you, you uh, you're talking about uh, partnership, and so they maybe they help your job and they, you help their job. So how to find out the partners? Oh, oh. well, um, one thing I think that's helpful is to be. Um, You know, it's a little bit more challenging to do in a in a virtual mm -hmm. environment, and I and I did benefit from having a little bit of time before COVID, before the pandemic hit and locked everything mm -hmm. down. So I did meet some of the team in person. Um, I flew out to their uh, facility and we uh, met each other. But there's most of the team that I've never met in person. So what that's meant is I've had to, um, you know, spend some time. Right? It could be jumping into some Slack channels, asking some questions, uh, mm. providing some information where people need it, um, but also even just taking time to do um, some one-on-one -on -one talks like we're doing right now, just to to learn what the other person is like and, and, and their, you know, their background and their, their concerns and their mm. hopes. Because um, it's the same sort of thing we would do uh, if we were in a physical office Mm -hmm. Right, you would just sort of you know, naturally go and get coffee or yeah, uh, take a break right. in the kitchen, and you would just talk about stuff in life. And it wasn't always a hundred percent about work, mm. and it, it means that in a in a virtual environment, in a remote online environment, we have to be very, um, very much uh, focused and attentive towards. Mm. Let's just talk as human beings and not mm. necessarily as coworkers and as uh, employees mm. of the company. And, and that's useful, I think, to to build a relationship between people. I see. So I think uh, uh, Americans want to communicate with body language or like uh, uh, hand 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 sign or something. So. But the uh, webcam focus on just face, so you 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 can't communicate easier with on the uh, online. I see. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you're quite right. Like even here, as we're talking, I'm using my hands a lot. Mm -hmm. You could see it in frame. Uh, uh, one thing I've I've sort of picked up to accommodate because you know in person I am a very you know gesture, hand gesture type person. Mm -hmm. And it's challenging because there's only so far you can see on camera. So what I've sort of started learning and paying attention to is uh, like the YouTubers that you talked about earlier, they, mm -hmm. uh, some of the really good ones, they're very cognizant of that picture frame. Mm -hmm. And so I have used some of their gestures and said, oh, if I was gonna do this in person, I can mm -hmm. get the same effect by using the same kind of gesture that they're doing, that they're doing. and and get mm -hmm. the point across. 
Uh, so, yeah. so learning from people who've who've had to deal with the medium uh, mm -hmm. has been, I think, a useful skill for having to communicate. So it's not just sitting there in a box, very <laughs> quietly staring. You can still be expressive. It's still be a person, right? Yeah. I know. I know. So, but uh, I think uh, uh, you can, uh, your podcasting skill can use uh, online uh, lesson or webinar or anything. I, I hope so. How do you think about uh, your skill, pod podcasting skill can use those method? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it is related. It is a little bit uh, it is a little bit different in that with podcasting, mm. we uh, we don't do it live, right? It's all um, oh. pre-recorded. Like we're talking to each other live, but it it's not as if we have an audience mm. live. So what that means is that if we make a mistake, we say, all right, let me restate that and then go mm -hmm. forward with it. And with podcasting, it's only audio. So mm. nobody can see what we look like. Right. Yeah, so there's right. no there's no camera in my face, whereas here or mm -hmm. uh, like on webinars and virtual conferences, uh, you are presenting to a camera um, and mm -hmm. there is that that trying to get the human touch like you would do in a uh, in a in a in work, you know, real world conference where uh, mm -hmm. in only the most challenging environments, would you be unable to see people in the audience and have um, eye contact with them? Mm -hmm. But something that's helpful for podcasting is it has helped me to learn about the tempo for mm -hmm. you know, oh. how long something takes to, yeah. to speak. Mm -hmm. So that's been very helpful for for conference talks where mm -hmm. usually you don't have a clock available necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like right there, you can watch just ticking down. Usually there might yeah. be uh, somebody in the audience from the, the organizers like holds up a little flag or something that says, you know, five minutes, one minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know. The, the podcasting thing has, has been really helpful because uh, we've been doing it for so long that I kind of know how long it takes for me to speak okay. a certain amount of content, right? If we hmm. have to fill uh, 25 minutes or 45 minutes or an hour, I roughly know about hmm. how much I would have to write for a presentation Mm, and knowing wow. my delivery speech and not being too fast and talking too fast and, oh my gosh, this one hour is done in <laughs> 10 minutes. Or talking really slow and uh, mm. oh, this 10 minute talk is an hour now, right? Like I've got a pretty good pace where I can speed up and down as necessary. So th that's wow. been really helpful for, for my experience in, in giving presentations. I see. So it means uh, you don't need a timekeeper for your session, right? I usually don't. And and to be <laughs> fair, so people understand, like, I still use my Apple Watch as a <laughs> an indicator. And usually, like, if, if a talk is, uh, you know, 30 minutes, I'll set it for 15. So I know what mm. is the midpoint. And because I've practiced, I know where the midpoint is on my slides. So if I'm going a little too fast, I can slow it down. If I'm going a little too slow, I can start speeding it up. Oh, so, uh, it's a good experience. Yeah, because like nobody, it just, you know, vibrates on my wrist and I'm yeah. the only one who knows that it went off. Nobody can see anything going off. There's not a, an alarm mm -hmm. bell. There's no flashing light. I just, you know, yeah, I just yeah. feel my wrist shaking. I'm like, all right, there you go. So I'm mm -hmm. just exactly at, this, at the right point where I should be. I see. So uh, thank you for your uh, great talk. And uh, uh, most of attendees want to hear about your talk at the conference. So uh, thank you for Jane for coming and sharing your knowledge or your profile and your talk. So uh, please enjoy the conference with us. So, and uh, thank you for coming today. Yes, thank okay. you for, thank you for in, inviting me to talk to you today. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to speaking on the conference. And I really hope that we can uh, all mm -hmm. share interesting information. And hopefully, people will learn a thing or two from my talk. So really excited mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. OK, so I'll uh, see you on November 14. OK. All right, see you then. Yeah, see you then. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Bye.